Hello folks, it's Silly Moustache here and welcome to my workshop come utility room uh, full of carrots and tomatoes and garlic and onions and stuff like that but also a slew of guitars which I'm going to use to demonstrate something. I want to tell you a little story. Sometime in the mid 70s I went to see a concert by Stefan Grossman, you all know him and um, it was in a Victorian style theatre and uh, Stefan Grossman walked out onto the stage with two guitar cases, laid them down and came to the front and said, ladies and gentlemen, there's been a misunderstanding here and uh, there is no house uh, PA system. And so um, I will offer you a choice. I can sit here and I can play these uh, guitars acoustically uh, or um, you can go to the box office and get your money back. Then he went to one of his guitar cases and he brought out a Martin double O size guitar, something like this. Um, he said, when this was built, before the days of amplification, this was called a grand concert. And he brought out another one. He said, when this was built, this was called an auditorium. And he looked around at this Victorian uh, theatre, which was pretty much full. And so um, he sat down and uh, started playing. And um, frankly, I think we all heard every word and every note. Now, was that because he played really hard? Were those guitars really, really loud? Or was it because they had another quality? They projected. Now this is the point, I believe, of the research and development of Martin guitars in the late 19th and early 20th century. They standardised at one point on five sizes. They had a size 2, which was amateur, which was a tiny little guitar, um, and um, a 12 inch width, body width. They had a standard one, which frankly I've never seen. Uh, they had the size O, which is like this, which they called a concert. Now this is by Eastman, as you can see, and they call it an E20P for parlor. Parlor? Concert? Well, my kitchen wouldn't be suitable for a concert. I don't know about yours. This one, as I've already said, was called a grand concert. Incidentally, all of the, uh, the Martin design instruments here are by either Eastman, these two, or Collins. So I'm covering two distinctly different price ranges here. The treble O that he brought out, the auditorium. Hmm, auditorium, what is an auditorium? I shall get to the dreadnought a bit later. Now, where would you typically hold a concert? It might be in a large drawing room at home if you had a large house. House concerts, you know, maybe 30, maybe, mm, surely not 50, but maybe, you know, 20 to 40. Um, a grand concert? Well, I'm thinking maybe something like that Victorian theatre. Um, I played in a Victorian theatre uh, which had 750 seats. Uh, so maybe somewhere between 400 and 800. Um, auditorium. I don't know how big an auditorium is, but just um, to compare with a, something that happened at a similar time that these instrument levels, models were being designed. 1889, the Chicago Auditorium seated 3,875 souls. Uh, incidentally, the size O was introduced in 1888, the size O 1898, and the triple O in 1902. And until 1931, this was the largest guitar that Martin made. Let's talk about sizes for a moment, because they differ. They are larger in volume. We tend to equally use volume and um, 
uh, and, and loudness in, in the same way. And I wonder whether it is. Um, I'm going to read these. Uh, the size O and the size double O had a 24.9 inch scale. This triple O went up to a standard scale of 25.4. Um, the low about on the size O was 13 and a half. The double O was 40 and one eighth, which is what, five, six, yeah, six eighths, three quarters, three quarters wider. The triple O was 15 inches, which is uh, seven eighths wider than the double O. Um, the body widths are interesting. They didn't move that much. The size O was four and three sixteenths. The double O slightly thinner at four and one sixteenth. And um, I think that's the same for the triple O as well. Uh, the Dreadnought, when it came out in 1931, had the same standard scale as the triple O. The lower bout was 15 and 5 eighths. So between the O at 13 and a half and the Dreadnought 15 and 5 eighths, you know, there's four different divisions there. And the body depth was four and three quarters from Four, uh, four and three sixteenths to four and three quarters in body depth between the four different sizes. Now, Gibson were rather late to the game when it came to flat tops. Uh, the first flat top they bought out was the LO, the L1 associated with Robert Johnson. Um, which had a very short scale, I think it was 24 inches. Cute, beautiful little thing. Uh, in 1926, the L00 sort of thing that this is modelled on, and this is really a Waterloo version of the Kalamazoo, the budget model, uh, reduced binding and everything, um, probably made of birch by Gibson in those days. This came out in 1932. Things were moving instrument was changing its um, its purpose. Uh, most of these guitars, including the 1931 um, Dreadnought, was really a, a 12 fret, wider neck than we're used to now, uh, for finger style, but for projecting finger style, single notes. But in 1934 it all changed. Now, the 14 fret Dreadnought came out in 1934, as I'm sure you'll know, as did the original Gibson Jumbo. Now, I haven't got one of those, but I have got this, which is a Santa Cruz version of the Roy Smek, which also came out in 1934. This only came out as a Hawaiian, but these are sought after because it does have that Gibson thrum. <laughs> someone comment on one of my earlier videos that they would like a smaller guitar but they don't think they didn't think they could get used to the boxy sound this Eastman mid-priced Eastman in uh, Adirondack spruce and uh, East Indian uh, rosewood sounds like this with light gauge strings short scale multiple times more than that but made essentially of the same wood um, the difference with Martin designs it, it, prior to 1931 is they were made to be balanced across the strings so no um, no heavy bass or no heavy trebles they were made to be balanced with the coming of the 14 fret red malt things changed now um, the OM that came out was uh, in 1929 was a modified version of the auditorium, the triple O, 
um, with um, a squished down body and a thinner, longer neck for the banjo players of the time changing uh, in uh, the dance and jazz bands. And it was brought out to compete directly with what Gibson were doing with the arch tops. Yeah. Um, now you've heard this. Well, you will. I'm sorry, I can't play for Toffee at the moment. My fingers are problematic. Compared to this. completely different sort of sound. Is this so pretty? Is, is this short of bass or treble? Does this sound boxy? Very different, of course. But it projected like crazy through the brass and things like that. But for solo and small combo, the flat top had it. Um, so it's projection. They were balanced, they were resonant, uh, they had sustain, which is not a factor that we think of with the art shop guitar. But they still project. I have had guitars that felt as if they were very loud, I could play them very loud and the sound came out of the sound hole and fell on the floor at your feet. Um, what the player hears is not necessarily related to what the audience hears, of course, but do you want a loud, loud guitar? Or do you want a guitar that people in the back row can hear clearly? A well-made, flat-top, acoustic guitar will project far more than you may think they will. And that doesn't mean hammering them with a heavy pick. It means playing them, whether it's finger style or plectrum style or flapping style or whatever. So that's the point I wanted to make. The difference between volume and loudness and balance and projection. They're different aspects. And I don't pretend to know the ways and hows, but I think there's been an awful lot more research and, and development and design by Martin in making these different guitars suitable for venues, yeah. But, um, you know, I don't think that a size O could be called a boxy guitar. Maybe if it was a cheaper version without the resonance. Maybe it's not suitable for playing with the bluegrass band where it has to cut through uh, instruments like banjos and fiddles. But uh, there you are, you pay your money and you take your choice. But don't think that a parlor guitar is a boxy guitar and don't think that a dreadnought is the answer to everything tonally. Uh, well, that's Andy's opinion. I shall put some details of the specs uh, in the detail box below this video, just to make sure I've got the facts right, because I often don't say what I intend to say. Um, and, but I would really appreciate your comments and queries below. I strive very hard to answer everything that comes through on YouTube. And um, so there you are, that's, that's my little demonstration of the different sizes of guitars and how they developed over really the 20th century. Uh, I would uh, just like to say uh, in this strange year, I'm in the second period of lockdown here in England and we're going to change our ways that we'll find out more about later today or later this week. So I haven't been able to go out and play, I haven't been able to go and gig. I'm being able to meet up with my friends and play, uh, but uh, I have uh, been asked to do some um, lessons during, by giving Zoom meetings, and um, I have some spare spaces now. So if anybody's interested in that, please contact me. Uh, my uh, my email address is on my about page of YouTube. Go down after the details. There's for business use or something. It's not a business, but you'll find my email address there. 
uh, I'd be very glad to help you and I love talking to other guitarists. So if you have been, thanks for watching. Bye for now. Bye.